University, and also the Director of Forensics, and he's going to explain the rules for today's debate. Good afternoon. The debate that we're going to have this afternoon is going to proceed in three sections. Uh, we are going to begin with opening statements from our candidates. We did a coin toss, and Congresswoman Nome will give our first statement. Then we're going to move on to a second section where they will answer questions which have been submitted from the Rapid City Journal, and then later on to questions which have been posed by you, the audience, which have been written down and given to me. Finally, we will allow the candidate to ask one other candidate a question and vice versa. Following that, we will have closing statements by the candidates, which will be five minutes long. Are you ready for me to begin? And Congresswoman Merrillick, I mean, uh, Congresswoman No. <laughs> 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 You have the opening speech. Thank you, thank you. Well, it's good to see so many people here today, and that uh, shows the fact that we've got a lot of important issues to talk about. And so I appreciate you all taking the time to come. I want to thank the Rapid City Journal for hosting all of us, and for Dr. Clark for being willing to moderate, and uh, for Matt for coming. Uh, it's going to be a good debate and a good conversation among all of us about the direction of our country. I think most of you in the room uh, probably know a little bit about me and have heard my biography before. You know that I live in the northeastern corner of the state, in Hamlin County. I've spent my life farming and ranching and, uh, and have a husband and three wonderful kids. I think what's great about elections is that they're about choices and about the choices that people have and differences among people. A lot of times when you look at individuals, you can see uh, that their differences reflect how they were raised or the way that they've lived and uh, that is represented in some of the things and the stands and the, that they believe in. Uh, and my background uh, has form formulated me and brought a lot of common sense into my life that I wanted to take to Washington DC when I ran. I spent some years in the legislature, ran for the first time for Congress in 2010, knowing that DC was a mess. Uh, when I got there I found out it's a wreck. Uh, that there is uh, it is broken, the process is non-existent, and that we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I ran because I was concerned about my kids and their future and all of the kids in this great state. I wanted them to have the same opportunities that I had when I was growing up. Uh, when we got there, we recognized that we had been spending money we didn't have, borrowing from foreign countries like China, and that we needed to change direction. We haven't gotten the ship turned around yet, but we have changed the conversation. From how much more can we spend to how much do we need to cut? How much do we need to tighten our belt to make sure that we're going to have a strong and secure country into the future? Um, some of those victories I'm, I'm proud of. I voted for a balanced budget amendment. I think it makes common sense. You guys, every day, uh, when you don't have enough money, you have to tighten your belt and prioritize where your dollars go. The federal government should have to do that, too. Uh, we were able to cut spending for the two years that I've been there uh, in a row, which is the first time that has happened since World War II. We've worked on important issues for South Dakota, a farm bill, um, making sure that we had policies in there that were going to be good for South Dakota and working to get that completed. But then also working to make sure that we protected Ellsworth from cuts that were coming, that we're fighting for our Hot Springs VA hospital, and also making sure that we have resources and, uh, to help against this pine beetle epidemic that's wiping out our Black Hills. All of those are small victories that we have. Uh, but we still need to keep working, and we still have work to do, and that's why I'm running again, is because I'm not done. I'm not somebody who's going to uh, give up just because it's tough. That means we need to pull our boots on and work a little harder and make sure that we finish what we started. Now, Matt is a very different person than I am. We have clear choice in this election. Uh, he has said that he's going to vote for President Obama again. Uh, he has said that he likes Obamacare. He wants to keep it in place. He has said that he wants to tax you more, that he wants to spend more money, and that, I believe, is the wrong decision for this country. I really, truly believe that we have to change the failed policies of this administration. And that is what this is all about, and the contrast between us. Uh, we have a lot of things in front of us that we have to deal with and talk about, and your choice is going to be very clear in this election. So I want to thank you for coming and taking the time to be involved and invest, invested in this race and making sure that you know the differences so that we can on election day, make sure that we have a representative that fights for South Dakota's values. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Ma'am? Well, thank you very much. Glad to know my mic is working. Um, 
I appreciate everyone being here today. I thank my opponent for participating in this debate. I thank the journal and the uh, University Center for putting this on. It seems fitting that on our only West River debate that we should be having a showdown at high noon <laughs> here where the Old West still lives. Now, this isn't exactly the OK Corral, but it's pretty good. So I thank everyone for being here. And you know, politics is a very frustrating business. And I know many of you are frustrated by it as well. And for some, there's a temptation to tune out the political debate because it's so frustrating. But we should never forget that we have brave men and women who have defended this country and defended our democracy uh, so that we all have the right to have these debates. And I think one way we honor all of our veterans is by exercising that right to our democracy. So I appreciate everyone who's here and who's uh, watching at home. And I thank you for being here. Just to introduce myself a little bit, I come from the southeast part of the state. I was born in Yankton and uh, grew up partly in Bon Homme County and then did all my schooling through high school in Yankton. Um, proud to be a fourth generation South Dakotan. I'm married to a South Dakotan, my wife and Maggie. We have two adorable little girls, if I do say so myself. Willa is almost four, and May is almost two. Um, I, uh, before becoming a candidate, was a staff person for Senator Tim Johnson. So I served the people of South Dakota in that capacity. And proud to say that my job was to work on economic development. So every day I woke up trying to help the Senator's efforts to help South Dakota become a more prosperous place, trying to help small businesses, trying to find resources for infrastructure and make this a more prosperous place to live. And I'm proud of that work. I'm also proud of some of the less glamorous jobs that I've had, jobs that are probably familiar to many of you. I was talking to uh, Noel Hamill here a moment ago about being a paper boy early on uh, for the Yankton P&D. Uh, the reality is I come from a family that never had much money, and consequently I've always had to work. And uh, I've also flipped a lot of burgers at Burger King. I was a dishwasher at the Quarry Steakhouse and Lounge in Yankton. I picked a lot of rocks and walked a lot of bean fields, so I know how to work hard. And in this race, one of my themes has been being a voice for middle class South Dakotans and hardworking people who are trying to climb their way into the middle class. I think I'm a good voice for that because of the life that I've lived. I know how to struggle and work hard and because of the life that we have all lived. Too many of us have a sense, and we are correct, that Washington seems rigged to serve somebody else other than the middle class. Washington seems rigged to serve the big campaign contributors, the millionaires and the billionaires, the big oil companies. Well, I'm running to try to tip the balance back in favor of regular folks. I'm also running because I share your frustration with the my way or the highway attitude that's so common in Washington, which is causing us not to make progress on the issues that we all care about as Americans, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent. We all want progress on the debt. We all want progress on energy and on the farm bill, but we're not seeing that progress because we have too, too many people who aren't willing to work together. Now, dysfunction has always been there, but it's especially bad in the U.S. House, which these days is dominated by the Tea Party faction. Now, we've seen that dysfunction uh, in the form of multiple threats, down, threats to shut down the government. We've also seen it with the farm bill, so it's really hitting home now. Farm bill is always important to South Dakota in an agricultural state like ours, it's especially important in a year when it's going to expire, and now it has, because they didn't get the job done. And when you consider the fact that we're going through this terrible drought, it's really hard to understand how that could happen. The Senate passed a good farm bill. It strikes a good balance on a lot of issues. It had bipartisan support from Senators Johnson and Thune, but the House didn't even vote on one because the House leadership team chose not to, and my opponent is part of the House leadership team. I think she needs to take some responsibility for the fact that this didn't get done. I realize that there are a number of factors at work, but since you're in the leadership team, since you represent that freshman class of Tea Party representatives, uh, I think more could have been done to try to get the, the bill passed. And of course, you can't help but wonder, maybe we wouldn't be in this situation with a failed farm bill if my opponent had been more focused on ag issues earlier on. But we've seen the media reports that on the Ag Committee, out of the 20 meetings that occurred in her first year in Congress, she only went to four out of 20. Now that was bad enough. Uh, but eventually we heard the explanation that, well, there are a lot of meetings to go to and, and she couldn't prioritize the Ag Committee. She had to go to the other committee. So we looked into that. We looked at the Native American subcommittee that she belongs to, and it turns out she only went to five out of 22 meetings there. And on the Early Childhood subcommittee, she only went to one out of seven. So the bottom line is we're not being heard in, in um, Congress. You know, people often ask me when I meet them on the street, Matt, what will you do differently? And the first thing I tell them is very simple. I'll show up. But I won't just show up, I will speak up and I'll be an aggressive advocate for farmers and ranchers and Native Americans and small business people and all South Dakotans. Because we only have one voice in the U.S. House, we have one seat. But too often that seat has sat empty, 
Too often our voice has been silent, and I'm going to make sure that our voice is heard loud and clear once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barely. Our first question comes from the Rapid City Journal, and if we could have Representative Noam respond first. Partisan politics has delayed renewal of the Farm Bill. Who is to blame, and can the legislation be passed before it expires this year? Well, let me just take a second to uh, address something that Matt brought up in his opening comments. He talked about my attendance record. And I will tell you right now that that's a false issue. It's an issue that's been a smear campaign that was started by the Democrats. And it was started uh, because of a lack of wanting to talk about the real issues like the Farm Bill that we have in front of us. Um, you know, folks, I've proven that I was at many of those meetings that they say that I wasn't. I have a 99% voting record in committee and 98% on the floor. I've held over 800 different meetings with South Dakota constituents. I'm not going to sit through a meeting just to sit through a meeting. I'm going to go where South Dakota needs me. And that's what I've done over the last two years. Now, when it comes to the Farm Bill, uh, the Farm Bill has always been a bipartisan piece of legislation. It's taken Republicans and Democrats to come together to get the job done. What's changed this year and why we don't have a Farm Bill right now is because the Democrats have virtually walked away from the bill. Because of reforms that we put in the food stamp program in the House Ag Committee, we have lost virtually all of the support of the Democratic Party in the House. Uh, they just aren't willing to support a bill with those kind of changes in it. I felt as though those reforms were common sense and made sure that the people who needed help really got it. I'm hopeful we can get a farm bill done. Uh, I know that it expired on the end of September and I've led the charge to make sure that we get it done. I worked with my Democratic colleague Peter Welch uh, from Vermont to circulate a letter to all of the members. We had 80 members signed on to that letter to go to the leadership team asking them to bring the bill to the floor. I also went to work and spoke at a Farm Bill Now rally telling people why we needed a farm bill, not just for certainty for our livestock producers and our commodity growers, but because of national security reasons, of how important it is to grow our own food in this country and that we don't depend on another country to feed us. Uh, so I also signed on to a discharge petition which would force the bill to come to the floor. Uh, we need to get this farm bill done, especially in light of this devastating drought situation that we have. And because the last farm bill didn't have livestock disaster provisions within it, so our guys out there don't have a safety net at all if they've been raising livestock in South Dakota. Nothing to help them with livestock losses or increased feed costs. And that's one of the reasons it's so critically important. Now I know it's been politi politicized a lot this year, but folks, you need to know that a farm bill hasn't been done on time before it expired for the last 35 years. It's been talked about in this election a lot because of the drought and because it's an election year. In fact, the last farm bill that was put together uh, by Democrats in both the House and the Senate uh, needed six extensions, and it was signed into law a year after it expired. So it is very important that we continue to work on a farm bill. It's my number one priority, but I will tell you I've been leading the charge to get that done, and we need to have Democrats come back to the table with Republicans and if we are, have agricultural knowledge to work together to make sure that we get that five-year farm bill, which will bring certainty for our producers here in South Dakota. Thank you. Mr. Verlin? Well, the fact that Congress often doesn't get their work done on time doesn't mean we should accept that and just let it happen once again. We should have got this done a long time ago. The Senate actually did pass a good farm bill, as we mentioned, and they did it months in advance of the deadline for expiration. But on midnight of September 30th, the Farm Bill expired. Now, sometimes in the past it has taken a while to pass a new Farm Bill, but usually they at least bother to pass an extension so that the programs don't just uh, expire. And this time they didn't even take the time to do that. So you had Congress that took a five-week August recess in the midst of a drought, came back into session for eight days of session, that's what I believe it was, and then adjourned without even bothering to pass that extension so they could go home for a seven-week recess, after the five-week recess, and ask people to re-elect them so we can get more of the same. But the American people don't want more of the same. They want progress. They want results. And for all the things that my opponent says she did, the results speak for themselves. The bill didn't get passed. And we can talk about whether uh, there are some people on this side of the aisle supporting it or that side of the aisle, but she's in the majority. She's in the leadership. She told us she has special access to John Boehner, and that would give us more opportunity to deliver results for South Dakota, but it didn't because he wouldn't bring it up for a vote. On the issue of forcing a vote on the Farm Bill, I strongly support that, and I strongly supported it early on, because we need to get this done. Um, now, my opponent has had several positions on it, so we have a distinction here. Originally, she signed a letter that said she supports forcing a vote on the Farm Bill. She signed it along with Bruce Braley, a congressman from Iowa. 
But when asked about it publicly, she changed her position and said, no, forcing a vote would be too divisive. I don't think it would be too divisive. I think we should be aggressive about this. But she thought it would be too divisive during the August recess. So we talked about this issue during the Dakota Fest debate, where I pressed the issue. And then the new third position that she announced was that, well, she would finally support forcing a vote on the Farm Bill in September if no vote had been scheduled. So that's three different positions. And when you finally did come around to forcing a vote on the Farm Bill, it was too little too late. And it's important, I think, to look at the number of members you were able to bring along with that discharge petition effort. You were elected by the freshman class of 87 Tea Party members to be their representative to the House leadership. How many of those supported the discharge petition that you finally signed on to in the end? By my count, none joined after you did. As a result, the Farm Bill is not passed. I'm in this race because the Farm Bill is just one example of a bigger issue. We need to make progress on these issues. We need to make progress on the deficit. We need to make progress on the production tax credit. And what that requires is people who are willing to work together and sit down at the table and find common ground and find those solutions so that we can move forward instead of just sticking into our ideological corners and telling farmers and ranchers, you're on your own because we've got to get home and campaign for re-election. That's not right. We've got to do better. Do we have rebuttals? You have two follow-up rejoinders. If you would like to use one now, you are welcome to. Oh, we only had two for the debate. Is that what we have? Correct. We'll move on to our next question then, and Mr. Verilich, you will be the first to respond. Many farms and ranches in South Dakota are family owned. Do you support repeal or reduction of inheritance taxes, the so-called death tax? Well, my view on the estate tax is that we should raise the exemption level so that it will not impact family farms and ranches in South Dakota or small businesses in South Dakota. And my opponent has talked about this issue as being one that's um, motivated her to get involved in politics because of her family situation. Uh, and I've said before that what happened to her family never should have happened. We should leave family farms and ranches out of the estate tax. But I don't think we should eliminate it entirely for millionaires and billionaires because doing that increases the deficit. And if you want to go to the extent of defending their tax breaks for the millionaires and billionaires at all costs, that increases the deficit and makes it more likely we have to do radical things on the spending side of the equation, such as privatize Medicare. And so this issue of the estate tax, where I believe we should protect middle class folks, protect family farms and ranches, but ask the folks at the top still to, to do their part and keep it in place for them, that's an example of the broader issue in this campaign, where I say we ought to stand up first and foremost for middle class folks, protect Medicare from privatization, for example. My opponent says no. I've taken a pledge to a guy named Grover Norquist to say that I'll protect those tax breaks first and foremost, and if anyone has to bear sacrifice, well, it's going to have to be the folks impacted by uh, Medicare or by Pell Grants and a host of other things that she wants to cut very deeply. So it's a fundamental difference we have, uh, and I stand squarely on the side of middle class folks here in South Dakota. You know, I believe that it's good for South Dakota voters to know where I stand on the issues. And so that's my only reason for signing that pledge. And that pledge just says I don't think it's right to raise tax rates. And especially now, in light of the recession that we have and how many people are struggling. Uh, absolutely, we need fundamental tax reform. And we need to have a much flatter and fairer system and get rid of the loopholes and exemptions that are there. But to raise tax rates on people right now when they're struggling is the wrong decision. So I won't agree with that uh, issue, and, and I do not agree with Matt on that issue. Now, when we talk about the Farm Bill and uh, the action that we've taken to try to get action on the floor, uh, again, the reason that the leadership team hasn't brought a Farm Bill to the floor is because uh, we don't have the votes. And we don't have the votes because the Democrats aren't there at the table. Uh, think of what would happen if you brought a Farm Bill to the floor and it failed. What precedent that would set for our food policy in this country. I voted no against adjournment. I didn't think we should come home in August until we did a Farm Bill. I also voted against the CR, which funded the government for the rest of the year because there was nothing in there for drought relief. There was nothing in there that had farm policy in it because that's how important I think it is. So it's absolutely incorrect to say that I haven't done everything in my power to try to get that farm bill done. Now when we get to the death tax, it is a personal issue for me. My dad was killed in an accident on our farm when he was 49 years old. It was a tragedy for us. I came home from school and worked with my family to try to keep our operation going, and it was devastating for me to find out that we owed the federal government tens of thousands of dollars because my dad died. Uh, we had to look at our situation and see if we wanted to sell land that had been in our family for generations, 
or if we were going to take out a loan to pay off those taxes that we owe the federal government. I decided that we would take out a loan, and we took out a 10-year note, but it made it very difficult for us to make a profit or cash flow for those first 10 years because of that tax that we had to pay to the federal government. The fact is, is that where you set the thresholds still makes death a taxable event. And I don't think death should be a taxable event. That income has been taxed before. And what we're doing is we are threatening the ability to pass our family farms and our small businesses onto our children. There, you get as much as one or two quarters of land at the prices that they sit today, you will be in a situation where the only way you can pay that federal estate tax is to sell the land. Now, if you grew up in South Dakota like I did and with a cowboy farmer rancher dad like I did, he told me, Christy, don't ever sell land because God isn't making any more land. Um, it's part of your family. It's part of your heritage. And you hang on to it. And the fact that the federal government and bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. can make a policy, make a law that threatens that, it offends me. And that's why I don't believe we need to have a death tax in this, in this country. I don't think death should be a taxable event. Mr. Verlick, would you like to exercise your first of two rejoinders? I feel like I'm phoning a friend on the, who wants to be a millionaire show. I'll use one of my two <laughs> comments, please. Yeah, first of all, on this pledge to Grover Norquist, uh, I just think it's a bad idea to sign your name on a document to say, I pledge my loyalty to you, especially when you're not a South Dakotan. This guy, Grover Norquist, is not a South Dakotan. He holds a lot of sway over a lot of people in Washington, but a lot of people think he holds too much sway, and that's part of why we have such dysfunction there. And one person who has even shared that view is former Republican Governor Mike Rounds. I believe he told the Rapid City newspaper, I think he told Kevin Wooster, that if he runs for office again, he would not sign the pledge to Grover Norquist because he would answer to South Dakota. And that, I think, is the right attitude. Uh, the fact that you simply take that tax discussion off the table uh, is part of why we're not making progress on a host of issues here. My opponent also says that, it, that uh, the Farm Bill wouldn't pass if it was brought for a vote. That's very much in dispute. The uh, Colin Peterson from Minnesota thinks he does have a lot of votes for the Farm Bill. And even if the Farm Bill didn't pass on that first vote, then we know what we need to do to fix it. And so I think we ought to have that vote on the Farm Bill. Uh, finally, on the estate tax, this is just a fundamental difference. We agree that we should exempt family farms and ranches. Where we disagree is whether we should protect Donald Trump at all costs. I don't think we should. I think we should protect Medicare recipients at all costs. <coughs> We will move on to our next question then, and this will have you responding first, Congresswoman. Governor Dennis Dugard has sued the federal government on several matters, most notably the Affordable Care Act, where he believed the Obama administration had overstepped its authority. What is your view of the role of federal and state governments? Well, I think we need to have a very limited federal government. I've always been a proponent of local control. Uh, and, and we see it every single day with decisions that uh, we have allowed the federal government to overstep and to make for our lives that are very difficult to change. When you give the federal government that kind of power, it's very difficult to come back when you're unhappy with it. Um, I was recently speaking to a local high school class of students, and I was telling them uh, that People make better decisions the closer they are to, to the instance and the people that it's affecting. Ask yourself all the time what you think the role of the federal government should be in your life. Um, should it be one that's broad and expansive and makes the decisions that you should be making for yourself? If you allow the decision to be made by a county commissioner or by a state legislature, it's much easier to be held accountable by them and to make them accountable to you and your will if you can complain to them and visit with them. It's very difficult to get 435 members of Congress to agree on something that really is impacting your livelihood back in the state. So I truly believe that the role of the federal government needs to be limited. I believe in states' rights, that they need to be protected. And especially when it comes to this uh, health care bill that the president uh, fought so hard for. In a time of recession, when we needed to get companies back and thriving in this country and jobs, he spent two years focused on passing this health care law which completely changed the way that we deliver health care in this country. It put the government in charge of making decisions that a patient and their doctor used to make. It also took $716 billion out of Medicare and used it to fund the new entitlement program. That's the biggest shame of the entire thing. When Medicare is already struggling, and we know how important it is to our seniors, and the Medicare trustees have said to all of us that it is in jeopardy in 12 years that it will be bankrupt, we have to be taking actions to save that program. 
And that's why I've, su I've supported a solution that will do exactly that. But what the president did, and what Matt supports, when he said he'll vote for this president again, and that he wants to keep this bill in place, it takes that $716 billion out of Medicare and plugs it right in to help pay for this new health care bill. And I don't think that's the right way to go. I won't do that to our seniors. That's why the plan I supported said, listen, for everybody 55 and older, nothing changes. For those who are younger in Medicare, you now have a choice, which is something that's not a given in the health care bill. You can either stay on traditional Medicare, if that's what you're more comfortable with, or you can choose a policy option that works for you, and the government will subsidize that. What a wonderful thing to have choices in this country. That's what makes this country great. We shouldn't have the government mandating how health care is delivered. We shouldn't have them taking from our seniors' programs that depend on it uh, for funding new entitlement programs. And the other wonderful thing about the solution that I supported is that it funds the wealthy less. It subsidizes wealthy people less. It helps those that are sicker more. And that's exactly the way that we need to be looking at our budget situation while we protect those important programs for our seniors. Thank you. Mr. Berlick? Uh, I am amazed that you're still using the $716 billion claim because, of course, numerous fact checkers have said that it is a falsehood. And the fact that you are willing to put it in your current ad and that you're willing to ask a family member to repeat that claim for you, I think, is tough to defend. The $716 billion claim, the idea that the health reform law cuts that money and takes benefits away from seniors, is false. And we know that it's false, partly because almost all of Christy Noem's uh, colleagues in the House, including herself, voted for the very same cuts twice in the Paul Ryan budget. To use the words of President Clinton, who talked about this in a recent speech, it takes some nerve to criticize someone for doing the very same thing you did. So we both agree that we should achieve those savings in Medicare. There's one thing we disagree on very fundamentally, though, and that is whether or not we should privatize Medicare, whether or not we should turn it into a voucher program. I oppose that, and she has voted twice to support it. Now, when she voted for it in 2011, uh, there was an analysis done of what would that mean for South Dakotans to have privatized Medicare, where you'd have to go out and find private insurance and you'd get a voucher from the government. Well, unfortunately, the analysis showed it would cost the average senior an extra $6,400 out of pocket. Now, she will tell us as a rebuttal, well, they can't replicate those numbers for the 2012 plan that she voted for. And that's true because there aren't enough details in the plan. But you voted for the 2011 plan that would cost seniors $6,400 out of pocket. I oppose that. You support it. And what's most galling about it is that you support that plan that would impose so much sacrifice on South Dakota seniors, partly to give huge new tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires. Those are really upside down priorities in my view, and I think take us in the wrong direction. Just to get back to the original question uh, regarding Governor Dugard and the role of the state and federal government, I'm proud of the time that I spent with Senators Johnson and Daschle, where I worked directly with Governor Dugard and his staff, Governor Rounds and his staff, Senator Thune and his staff, on a whole host of projects around South Dakota, like the Homestake Underground Lab Project, which is a great partnership between the federal government and the state government, where the state government made an investment early on, and now the federal government is hopefully going to take over. That's a great example of what we can do when we bring an attitude of partnership instead of being adversaries. I don't think the federal government should hand off responsibilities to the states, slash Medicaid, for example, and say, South Dakota, it's up to you to figure out what to do with all those nursing home um, residents who depend on Medicaid for their care. Uh, local control is very important, but it shouldn't be local control with new local burdens imposed by the federal government. You know, the $716 billion question that we're all talking about uh, is, uh, savings that when, when reformed in Medicare, which the Medicare trustees have said is in jeopardy, and a plan that I supported, what we did with that savings is we plugged it right back into Medicare to strengthen and to build the program to make sure it was going to be around in the future. Now, Matt, if the $716 billion I know that, that you support that's in the health care bill, if it, if it doesn't go to fund Obamacare, then where does it go? When, the, you, when you get that savings on Medicare, where does it go then? It goes because to close the prescription drug dollar hole and to shrink the overpayments to uh, the insurance companies, and yours goes into tax cuts. It doesn't. And that's, that's the clear There's fundamental difference. There's no fact difference. checker who agrees with that. You're making is this there, No, I'm, I'm certainly not. It's the absolute truth. And that's what's so interesting to me is that as you sit here and you look at the $716 billion, we plug it back into the program to strengthen this country and deal with its deficit issues. What this does... And what those cuts do to Medicare is that it funds Obamacare. And that is the truth, and that is what we have to get to the bottom of in this election and in this campaign. That, uh, that health care bill 
is detrimental in so many ways, but that's one of the key areas that has been absolutely false. You keep talking about privatizing Medicare and vouchers, and everyone agrees that it's not privatized. And a voucher is where you get a certificate from the government and then you have to go out and you have to look for your own health insurance policy. That's not the plan that I support. The plan that I support says, listen, voluntarily you can either stay on traditional Medicare or you can go out and look for a plan of these subsidized plans that the government already has. There's no vouchers involved. But what is happening is that Matt Farrelleck is trying to scare people in thinking that Medicare is in jeopardy. And what we are trying to do is to save the program because it is important. The Medicare trustees that are entrusted to make sure that this program stays strong into the future are nonpartisan people. Some of them are the president's own people. And they have said that no solution for fixing Medicare means that you're going to let it go bankrupt. And that's the only solution that Matt Verilek has. He hasn't looked at the challenges that we face at this country and been willing to support a plan that makes sure that Medicare is going to be around in the future. And that's the debate that we're having today, is that in times like these, when you have a federal government that's going over $4 billion in debt every single day, when you've got an administration that wants to tax people more, wants to take more money out of your pockets and spend it on the wasteful spending that they've been doing over the years, that doesn't even do a budget on the Senate side for three years. Mm -hmm. And when the president does a budget, he can't even get a Republican or a Democrat to vote for it. And what Matt's solution is, is to come back to the American people and say, we need more money. We need more of your money to spend it because we just don't have enough. Folks, that's wrong, and we can't let it happen. This Thank government you. has to figure out how to make sure that it lives within its means and fund our priorities. And Thank you. We well. need to move on. Would you like to rejoin? Well, Doctor, since we had the red card, it was up there for quite a long time. Would it, would it be okay? For yes, we'll allocate you another minute. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I heard you right, but did you say that you didn't support the privatization plan in 2011 and 2012? Because the votes are very clear. Whether you call it a voucher or privatization, people would no longer be able to get traditional Medicare. They would get this voucher, and they would use that to pay for their private care. That was the 2011 plan. Now, I realize you took a lot of heat over it, and so you modified the plan for 2012. But even that plan would be very harmful to South Coast seniors. So I'm not exactly clear if you're disavowing the plan, or if you actually think that privatization is a good thing for South Coast seniors, but I don't. Now, we agree that Medicare does face challenges, and we agree that we need to take steps to fix it. But you've told us in speeches that there are two options, let it go bankrupt or privatize. I say there's a third option, and that is to preserve and strengthen traditional Medicare. And in fact, on the anniversary of Medicare being signed into law, I released a position paper that laid out in concrete terms some of the ways we can do that. When the Argus leader asked you about my plan, you said, you know, I probably would agree with some of that. So to say that I don't have a plan, that's not fair. And in fact, I think the plan is preferable because it would preserve the program that South Dakotans like, that has worked well, and that is so important for us in the future. We'll move on to our next question. And Mr. Verilink, this will be your opportunity to respond first. Black Hills Power is retiring some of its coal-fired power plants because it's too expensive to refit them to comply with EPA regulations. To pay for construction of new natural gas plants, BHP said it will ask for a rate increase from the Public Utilities Commission. Do you support the EPA's policy regarding greenhouse gases, even if it means higher energy prices to consumers? Well, this is an important question, and it's one that I also addressed uh, when I visited with folks from East River Electric, uh, based out of Madison, that served much of uh, eastern South Dakota. And that, by the way, was a, a joint invitation where my opponent could have been there to discuss these issues, but she turned it down, uh, like she's turned down so many debates. But this is an important topic to discuss. Coal is going to be a key part of our energy future for a long time to come, and we need to recognize that. Coal is part of our baseload generation, it is affordable, and because it's going to be part of our long-term energy future, we need to continue finding ways to improve its efficiency, to invest in clean coal technology, and the idea that the, uh, this EPA standard could potentially make it impossible to build future coal plants, I think, is wrong, and I don't agree with it. Now, part of the reason some coal plants aren't being built is that natural gas is also very cheap these days, and so that makes the economics of that choice very different. Natural gas, natural gas is great as well. Uh, it is efficient, it is clean, and so we ought to promote that availability as well. And in general, I believe in a diversified energy strategy where we rely on lots of sources of energy, not just one or the other, because if you put all your eggs in one basket, when the, the fuel source changes price, uh, you can be in a big, uh, in a big bind. Uh, I also believe we should support wind energy. 
And one of the ways we do that is through the production tax credit, which has been very effective at promoting wind energy uh, across the country, and especially here in South Dakota, where we have such great wind potential, but we haven't fully realized it yet. Unfortunately, the production tax credit is one more case where Congress has failed to act, and the fear is that the tax credit is going to expire, and we're seeing concrete impacts from Congress's failure in Aberdeen right now, where 92 people lost their job at the molded fiberglass factory where they build wind blades. That's bad news. In addition, at Mitchell Technical Institute, uh, we're training people to be wind blade and wind turbine technicians, and the people who are graduating from those programs now don't have as many opportunities as they would have. Folks who might host a wind turbine on their, their land, farmers, for example, they don't have as many opportunities. So we're seeing concrete impact from this dysfunctional Congress. Uh, it's one more reminder of why we need to elect people who come with a willingness to work together, come with a willingness to seek common ground, to work with Republicans, Democrats, and independents to make progress on the issues that we all care about. Well, I'm very concerned about Black Hills Power and what's happening there and the rate increases that will go down to the customers as a result of EPA regulations. Uh, the fact is, is because of these boiler regulations that are coming out, they have coal-fired plants that are in jeopardy. And, you know, South Dakota relies heavily on coal to generate our electricity, to generate our energy. It's, it's one of our number one sources that we utilize to make sure that we can live our lives every single day here. So when EPA regulations come out, that regulate them and put some of these plants in jeopardy. It has an impact, impact on everyday people that we see walking down the streets that are our neighbors, people we sit by in church, and it's something that we need to take very seriously. It's why I supported a bill that would prevent the EPA from moving to some of these regulations that they want to. Some of the technology that they're asking these plants to comply with isn't even feasible at this point of time. And that's why we need to make sure that we don't have these kind of regulations coming down and hurting South Dakotans at a time when we certainly haven't uh, been able to even comply with what the regulations are that they've got coming. Uh, we've passed that bill out of the House that has put a stay on that regulation. The Senate hasn't taken any action. When you look at greenhouse gases and you look at that issue, it's very clear the difference between Matt and myself. Uh, Matt has spent 10 years of his life working on policy when it comes to global warming and traveling to United Nations conferences talking about that and the need for a national energy tax. Some of the very policies that the EPA is trying to implement through their, implement through their regulations that they're pursuing right now. Uh, that's what concerns me. Uh, when you look at a national energy tax and what it is, essentially a national energy tax says, you know, you get to, the government decides you can use this much energy for the year. If you use more than that, then we're gonna tax you for that. And when the South Dakota Public Utility Commission did a study on this, they found that if Matt could have had his way and that policy would have gone in place, that every single South Dakota family would have paid up to $1,500 more per year for their electricity bills. That it would have raised the price of planting an acre of corn by $79. That it would have cut farm profits in half in the coming years. It would have devastated South Dakota. So while I recognize that we uh, have some challenges in front of us with being able to provide electricity and power to South Dakota, we can't allow the EPA to jeopardize our way of life here in South Dakota with policies that they put into place. And that's why we need to have someone in Congress who fights and understands the common sense of all this. When you look back at our uh, carbon emissions over the last 20 years, they've decreased. We didn't need a Kyoto Protocol, what Matt championed uh, in his previous life. We didn't need to have a national energy tax put in place. They decreased over the last 20 years because of the development of natural gas and making sure that there were um, achievements in that area to make sure that we had less carbon in our air. Uh, that's the way to do things, to incentivize things to happen. Uh, when we look at our energy structure, I'm supportive of uh, all of the renewable fuels as well. Uh, we need to incentivize American-made energy. Uh, I don't, if it's coal, oil, biodiesel, ethanol, wind, if we can make it here and it makes us less reliant on the Middle East, then that's what we need to promote because America needs to stand on its own two feet in order to be truly strong and survive these turbulent times that we live in. Uh, you brought up this national energy tax claim, and I know you want it to be true. Uh, it is not true, and in all the efforts to have you substantiate it, you haven't been able to show that it's true. However, the artist leader looked at this extensively, and they said that the way I described things was accurate, and that you were making a false claim. Likewise, the Peer Capital Journal looked at this claim and said it is How not true. How did you true. describe those ten years? 
that I was an analyst on this issue and I understand it very well. I understand the costs and the benefits and I don't support it. And I asked you if you could substantiate that and you haven't. And likewise, once again, those two media organizations have said that it's not true. On the issue of climate change, though, I want to be clear. I do believe it's real. And I do believe humans have a role in it. And I do believe we should take actions on it. We should do that in a way, though, that both grows our economy and deals with the issue at hand. And we can do that by promoting wind energy, for example. Now, my opponent is someone who, when she was in the state legislature, voted for a resolution that said climate change is caused by a variety of factors, thermological, meteorological, astrological. So the fact that I'm a Taurus supposedly has something to do with the climate system. That's outrageous. And you've said that you don't believe climate change exists. We need to get serious about the science and serious about passing the production tax credit so we can tackle climate change and grow our economy. You know, I, I said that I didn't believe that humans were solely to blame for climate change. That is the stance that I have always taken. And, uh, you know, the, your claims that you have solely been an analyst uh, just don't sit well with me. I've got reports in front of me. Because I see the document you're talking about. Yes. That's from 1997, and I was a reporter at a conference. Well, just like Kevin Wooster report, reporting on this debate. In this report, you call the Kyoto Protocol the way ahead. Capping and treating emissions are central to the Kyoto Protocol. In this report, which you wrote, you sure call you for penalties on those who don't participate in carbon trading. I do not call for penalties. In That's this false. report, you write we, that we, for we, carbon we, trading we, markets to succeed, they typically need <laughs> government caps on emissions. That's but an that, analytical that's statement. That's, that's, true. that's saying that in order to make these be successful, that we need a national energy tax and we need carbon trading and cap and trade, which is something that would devastate South Dakota's way of life. And that's why, you know, Matt, I wouldn't spend 10 years of my life working on something I didn't believe in. Now, maybe you would, but for me, if I'm going to dedicate that much time to something, I'm going to make sure that it's worthwhile and something I believe in my heart. Congressman Milne, you've just recited analytical statements where I said, if you do this, here's what will happen. If you do this, here's what will happen. You also cited a report from 1997, which I uh, wrote as a journalist, where I was covering the comments of the participants, just like Kevin Wooster is covering the comments of the participants. So for you to attribute him supporting something you said in this debate, it's the same thing you're trying to do to me. And that's crazy. Kevin, but on the issue of climate change and energy, <laughs> you should know, we don't have to look back to 1997 to analytical reports that I looked at. In your case, we can look at the fact that you have taken thousands of dollars in campaign contributions just in the last couple of years from big oil companies, like ExxonMobil PAC, Halliburton PAC. We can look at the fact that as a member of Congress, not 12 years ago, 15 years ago, you voted to protect subsidies to big oil companies. All right, I'm going to ask, said, it, I'm going to ask that both stop here. We still have a few questions to ask. I love good cross-examination, but we've got a lot of good questions, too. Representative, this question will be yours to answer first. And this is from our uh, Andy Ansi, RC Chair of the Chamber. What are your plans to reduce the debt? Absolutely. I'm going to take 30 seconds, though, to answer some of the charges that Matt was making about big oil, because we haven't touched on big oil yet. And honestly, I'm, there's only one person sitting up here at these tables right now that is actually traded in big oil, but a speculator in that market, and it's Matt. It's not me. And so when you talk about big oil, I would, somebody would need to tell them that they're friends of mine, uh, if that's true, because they currently have friends of theirs that are running ads against me in South Dakota because I've supported renewable fuels. So those claims don't hold any water. And uh, you can keep saying them, but the more you say them doesn't make them true. You're saying you're to, not, you didn't take $70,000? To go on and to say that I'm in the pocket of big oil simply isn't accurate. So now going forward, when you talked about dealing with this country's debt and dealing with the debt that we're facing in this country, you know, I, we started tackling that as soon as I was elected and sent to Washington, D.C. Uh, when we came in, the first thing that we did is we cut our office budgets by 5%, recognizing we couldn't ask anybody else to tighten their belts if we weren't willing to do it ourselves. This, the next year, we cut it another 6%. Uh, in the time that I've been in the House, I voted to cut over $6 trillion worth of government spending, recognizing that the path that we're on is not sustainable. I don't want us to end up looking like Greece or Europe. I recognize that that's not doing service to our children. Uh, we have made cuts to different programs, to different departments, to different agencies. Some of the ones that specifically that I can identify right now, I cut uh, funding for a fund for Ireland, for a historic whaling partners fund that we had. The White House had an unanticipated needs slush fund that they were utilizing that I cut. I cut funding for uh, another engine uh, 
for a jet engine. Uh, those things all need to be examined. And when you have to look at each of those situations and say, is this something worth borrowing money from China for? It's pretty easy to see if it's a priority for your country. And that's the basis that I've utilized, recognizing that we can't fool ourselves any longer in this country, folks. That we have kids and grandkids that are picking up the tab for the spending habits of this government. And it's not fair. For me, it's been a moral issue. I don't think it's right to do it, and that's why I'm doing everything I can to make sure that we stop. Well, this is a fundamental difference that we have about how to tackle the debt and whether we're serious about the debt. I believe we need a balanced approach to balancing the budget. So that means we need a combination of spending cuts and changes to the tax code. I don't think in this environment with such huge deficits that we can afford not only to renew the Bush tax cuts entirely, but to give huge new tax breaks on top of that. And so I support that balanced approach, making spending cuts like, for example, uh, ending direct payments in the Farm Bill, but I don't think we should renew the tax cuts for those at the very top. Let's keep taxes low for middle class families, working families, but not uh, uh, go to the mat just to protect the interests of the wealthiest Americans who are already doing just fine. I'm glad they're doing fine. But I want to make sure we give more people the opportunity to do fine. Uh, my opponent supports a different approach, and that is a cuts-only approach, because she took the Northwest Pledge and says that she will not entertain any changes to the tax code that would increase revenue. What that means, though, is if uh, you're going to try to uh, have any impact on the debt, then you've got to make draconian cuts in things that impact regular South Dakotans. So she has voted to cut Head Start for kids who are in a disadvantaged situation, need a little extra help, getting uh, up to speed by the time kindergarten comes around. She has voted to cut Pell Grants. Now, I'm someone who needed Pell Grants to go to college. I'm someone who needed Stafford loans to be able to go to college. And I think other kids, if they're willing to work for it, ought to have that opportunity to go on to college themselves. And I don't think we should cut Pell Grants. Uh, she has also voted for this privatization plan to Medicare uh, and forcing South Dakota seniors to sacrifice and also to cap Medicaid, uh, which would impose a great burden on uh, middle class South Dakotans. And so we have a very um, big difference of opinion here. Now, if you don't make all those cuts that she's talking about and you just give huge new tax breaks like she supports, that actually will increase the deficit. So I think if you're serious about the deficit, and not just serious about protecting tax breaks, but if you're serious about the deficit, you've got to take that balanced approach. And there's broad agreement about this from all the analysts that have looked at it. It's only the folks that are taking the Norquist Pledge that say, no, we can only look at deep, deep cuts. And then you look at some of the important priorities we have where we actually do need federal investment, such as the Pine Beetle, or such as the Deep Underground Lab, uh, and many other investments across South Dakota. Uh, but we have our congresswoman saying she's working so hard to cut funding and to make it harder for those uh, investments to get funded. And so we need someone who's on the side of South Dakota families, who takes a balanced approach, who will make those investments where they're needed, make spending cuts where they're needed, and actually make progress on the deficit. Thank you. you. Know, those, uh, cuts that Matt refers to um, in those areas that he talked about with Pell Grants. I want you to know that the reductions were back to 2008 levels. We've seen such a dramatic increase in the amount of spending in the federal government that we felt it was reasonable to reevaluate where we were just a few years ago and try to uh, make sure that we were making uh, wise decisions and give, still giving the help to children and college students who needed to go to school, but still try to make sure that we were accountable to the hardworking taxpayers without going after more money out of their pockets to try to keep the doors open on the federal government. Now, Matt has said that he supports President Obama's tax plan. And so when I look at that tax plan, I just want to see what it happens to South Dakota when it's put into place. I will tell you that an Ernst & Young study just came out and looked at that tax plan and what the effects would be on South Dakota. South Dakota would lose 2,200 jobs. I'm not going to look 2,200 families in the eye and say, because I needed more money at the federal government level, that we decided you lost your job for that. 95% of the small businesses in South Dakota file their income taxes as individuals, and this rate could touch them. It's up to 63% of the private workforce could be the people that would be impacted by this. 200,000 people in South Dakota impacted by the tax increases that Matt's talking about. So he may want to talk about Donald Trump, and he may want to talk about millionaires and billionaires, but really, it's the person sitting next to you at the ball game. It could be your grandfather. It could be your child. Uh, it could be you. And, Thank you. And the reality we have Mr. Merrill really at about, about a minute and a half time uh, disadvantage. So would you like to rejoin to that and elaborate? I will allocate to you two and a half minutes to respond to make up for the disadvantage. 
we're talking about tax changes for those making two hundred fifty thousand dollars and above. When I go to the ball game, it's not often I get to sit next to one of my fellow South Dakotans that makes two hundred fifty thousand dollars or above. It's very rare. We're talking about one or two percent of individuals. But if you're going to defend tax breaks for that one or two percent, then you have to impose such sacrifice on the rest of us. Sacrifice on people who need a Pell Grant to go to college. Sacrifice on folks who want resources for the Pine Beetle. Sacrifice on Head Start and all those things. I don't think we should defend those at the very top at the expense of all the rest of us. And the idea that we're going to give these huge new tax breaks and maybe not make cuts means you're going to blow the deficit even wider. We need to get serious about this, and take a balanced approach, make key investments, also make spending cuts, and if we do that, we can actually tackle this deficit and imagine the economic <laughs> impacts it would have to make progress on the deficit. Right now, I don't think that the world of investors or, or small business owners believes that this Congress has the will to do the right thing and actually reach a deal on the deficit and make progress and start to bend the curve on our debt in a downward direction. But imagine if we reached a deal. Imagine the confidence that would give to investors everywhere and small business owners. I think that would have a huge positive impact on the economy, and that's why I support that position. Thank you. The next question, you will have the opportunity to respond first, Mr. Barrow. What is your view of religion and government? Well, I am Catholic. I'm someone who is influenced by my values as a person who was raised in the church, and I've also uh, been able to go to Lutheran churches and Episcopal churches over the years. And one of the reasons I got involved in public service is because uh, of that upbringing. And in fact, my name is Matthew. My favorite Bible verse is in the book of Matthew, and it's about that which you've done to the least of these you've done to me, referring to Jesus and to God. So I am motivated by the desire to help my fellow South Dakotans in every way that I can, just like so many of you work every day to help your fellow South Dakotans. At the same time, I think we need to have great respect for religious diversity, and even though each of us has our own spirituality and our own religious tradition, we need to be careful that we don't impose that on others, and that's the balance that I would try to strike. You know, my faith guides virtually every decision that I make. Um, you know, I, I love the Lord and I serve Him with all my heart. Uh, I think that our government in America was founded on, by people who had a strong faith. They came here for freedoms and for religious freedoms, and that's something that we need to continue to protect. We respect each other and our differences as well, but we need to make sure that we protect those freedoms that we've always valued so much here in the United States. I'm very concerned when you look at the president's health care law, what it's doing to some of the religions. Uh, that have beliefs that they deeply hold. Uh, when you look at the Catholic Church, which is Matt's, Matt's church that he adheres to, uh, they are being compelled by this law to act against their deeply held religious beliefs. And I don't think that it's right when the federal government comes in and forces a church to sue them for relief from having to be held to a standard that prevents them from being able to practice their religious freedoms such as that they hope to do. So the policies of this administration concern me as to how we value people of faith, how we value religions in this country. And I think we need to continue to make sure that we protect those with everything that we have. I'll just say on the issue of contraception and uh, respect for religious institutions, I believe there should be a compromise and, and uh, progress has been made in this direction to make contraception available under health plans, but also protect religious institutions from having to do things violate uh, their own beliefs, and I think that compromise can be struck. The idea, though, that we're going to let people uh, decide not to cover contraception, I think is problematic, uh, not only for reproductive reasons, but also because doctors prescribe contraception for a whole host of medical reasons unrelated to reproduction, and I think when women have to worry about whether or not they can have access to contraception in an affordable way, uh, I think that's very troubling, and I think that's a debate uh, from decades ago, uh, and I think we should get past it. Our next question will lead off with Congresswoman No. Do you support renewable energy initiatives, and should they be mandated for utilities? Well, I do believe that there is a very great need in this country to focus on renewable fuels, ones that have been proven to be very uh, beneficial and have been reliable sources of investment that we can start uh, as a country relying on in the future. Ethanol is the perfect example of that. Uh, and right now, when you look at the ethanol industry, what it's providing for our economy here in South Dakota and what it's providing for renewable fuels has really allowed us some economic freedom here in South Dakota that we can talk about and use as a testimony 
as to what renewable fuels can do for our country. Uh, so I do believe that that is um, something that we need to continue to pursue. I support the renewable fuel standard, which is one of those um, uh, requirements that we have in our federal government. When you look at the ethanol uh, situation right now as they have it, uh, we have lost the tax credit, the VTAC tax credit. I sponsored a bill that dealt with that, that actually eliminated the VTAC tax credit, took some of the money and put it towards deficit reduction, but took the balance of that going towards infrastructure to make sure that people who wanted to use <coughs> renewable fuels were able to do that when they wanted to uh, have the infrastructure and a pump that was available to them. It was something that the ethanol industry was asking for. They said that the consumers just don't have access to our product because these stations don't have the pumps available. and was a real win-win situation for South Dakota, for our country, and for our fuel situation. So that is something that I have supported. When you look at wind, when you look at uh, other sources that have proven themselves to be very useful, it is something that we need to continue to encourage. What I'm bothered by is a mandate that comes out of Washington, D.C. that doesn't look at the cost-benefit analysis of requiring a portfolio of renewable fuels. And that's what's hit some of our utility companies. When they don't look at what that actually does to people and the rates that they're going to have to pay, especially in a time of recession like we face, and they don't have a cost-benefit analysis done, what they've essentially done is mandated something that these companies are having a tough time complying with, and the costs are going to be passed on to the consumers. So that, that does disturb me, and I think that that kind of loss of contact with the ordinary people and what the effects are on people back in South Dakota is a real concern that's coming out of this administration. Well, I strongly support renewable energy, both when it comes to fuels uh, for transportation, uh, as well as for electricity generation. When it comes to electricity, again, the biggest thing we can do is get that production tax credit extended. That's something that's on the plate of this current Congress, and they haven't done it. And it's partly because there's a lot of Tea Party opposition. A lot of the folks in the Tea Party say we shouldn't be uh, picking winners and losers is the terminology that they use. Well, I think we should pick our energy future. I think we should decide if we want clean wind along with a portfolio of diverse generating units. Uh, my opponent sometimes even uses that terminology, though, saying that she doesn't support picking winners and losers, and yet also tells us she supports win. But the results speak for themselves. It's not getting done, partly because people won't work together in this Congress. On ethanol, I strongly support ethanol and preserving the RFS. It is a difficult time. Corn prices are very high. Uh, that uh, impacts our livestock producers and impacts the economics of biofuels production. But we shouldn't make short-term decisions uh, in a way that can harm our long-term prospects. Because, of course, all the biofuels we produce prevents us from having to import uh, fuels from other countries. Now, the Farm Bill uh, that was passed on the Senate side uh, actually contained helpful provisions for ethanol. Unfortunately, the House version of the Farm Bill had some anti-ethanol provisions. For example, it would remove all funding for what's called the BCAP program, Biomass Crop Assistance. And that's an important program for developing the next generation of biofuels after corn ethanol. Uh, it would also prevent USDA from using funds under the REAP program for blender pumps. Blender pumps, of course, allow uh, anyone who wants to to choose ethanol when they're at the gas pump. But uh, <coughs> opponents of ethanol in the House, controlled by um, uh, my opponent's uh, caucus, uh, they put in that anti-ethanol provision. So there are things that we should improve upon in that House version of the Farm Bill so that we continue to advance biofuels and wind energy, because those are huge growth sources for South Dakota. We could do a lot more wind. We could have even more ethanol in the state and create more economic opportunity for people who need it. Thank you. Mr. Verley, several reservation counties in South Dakota are among the poorest in the United States. What can Congress do to help the economies in Native American communities? It's a great question. It's very important. Uh, I spent two days prior to this in Rosebud and on Pine Ridge. In my time with Senator Johnson, I'm proud to say that I worked extensively on economic development across South Dakota, and particularly in Indian Country. Um, I think in general, when it comes to issues related to Indian Country, we need to respect the sovereignty of our tribes. We need to try to uphold treaty and trust responsibilities. And doing those things means being a partner with leaders in those communities, not forcing ideas from outside, but finding out uh, where we can uh, work together and actually make progress. Uh, some of the things that I've seen work very well relate to promoting small business growth in Indian country so that jobs will take off, businesses will take off, a middle class will start to grow to an extent we haven't seen it now. One way to do that, for example, is through what the Lakota Fund is doing on Pine Ridge. 
Lakota Fund helps to provide loans to entrepreneurs on Pine Ridge, but also assistance to those entrepreneurs so that maybe they've got a great idea for a business, but they don't quite know how to do the marketing piece. Or maybe they haven't done the accounting piece before. So the Lakota Fund provides the loan and the assistance to make sure that, that loan is successful, the business grows, jobs are created, and uh, that has great potential for us. In addition, I think the federal government needs to make investments uh, in infrastructure and help to, uh, to fund things like sewer systems and water systems, uh, because that infrastructure is essential. And if that infrastructure is in place, and if we have strong tribal colleges training nurses and, and uh, a future middle class, then we can make progress on economic development. And doing that will help to make progress on a whole host of other issues. Because when you have more money in your pocket, when you have a good job, you feel good about yourself, you have less crime, you have uh, more opportunity, and that's the direction we need to go. There are several things that we can do, and, and right now several of our tribes are struggling with water projects, water projects that were started and, and put into place um, and incentivized by the federal government that just hasn't been completed. Uh, when we look at funding from our federal government, uh, in the past, a lot of times members of Congress would use earmarks. When I came in, we realized how much earmarks were being abused, and so earmarks were banned. But the part that I've advocated that would help our tribes so much with some of their water projects that they need is that authorized projects, and projects that are important for clean drinking water, that serve people, that have needs when they could create a business and start a business there, but they can't because they don't have water supply, that those kind of projects need to be treated differently. And that when those are authorized, they're no longer considered an earmark anymore. It's something that the federal government looks at very differently as a thoroughly vetted project and something that is important and needs to be a commitment by that department or the Bureau of, or the Department of the Interior to look at to make sure that they prioritize their funds every single year to make sure that they complete those projects. So those are some of the things that we've been working on to try to help our tribes with, recognizing that their hands are tied when it comes to economic development, a lot of times because they just don't have adequate water supply. They don't have adequate water supply for their homes, but for creating businesses as well. Other things that I've done is I sponsored a bill this year uh, that said that the National Labor Relations Board didn't have any jurisdiction over businesses on tribal grounds. Um, the National Labor Relations Board has been in several areas of the country coming into tribal reservations, um, into Indian country, and saying that they have jurisdiction to come into these businesses. Now, our tribes are sovereign nations, and the NLRB doesn't have any authority there. And the bill that I sponsored and carried uh, would make sure that they can't come in there and try to unionize a tribal business and take some of those decisions away from our tribes when it's critically important to them that they maintain that control in the future. I also, in the Farm Bill, put in an uh, amendment that established a permanent office of tribal relations. Right now there's a temporary one there, but when I visited the Lower Brule Tribe, they told me that they have a lot of problems with really recognizing all of the programs that might be available to them. Uh, farmers and ranchers can participate in farm programs, but that tribe was having difficulty really realizing what they could participate in, what was available to them. Having a permanent office of tribal relations without increasing the budget of USDA is the right way to go to make sure that they know what options are available to them as they try to stimulate economic development there. And the last thing that I did is on my service on the Education and Workforce Committee is that I voted to um, bring more resources into job training for our Native Americans almost doubled it to make sure that when they had opportunities for economic development that there would be training resources there for them so that they could be adequately skilled to make sure they could fill those jobs into the future to make sure that they had those opportunities in a lot of the areas. But one of the things nobody really talks about is the fact that when we come to this VA hospital in Hot Springs, that hospital serves a lot of Native Americans from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Taking care of people and making sure that they have a good life is very important for that too and that's why I'm fighting for that hospital. Congresswoman Nome, I'd like to ask you a question that's pretty close to home for me. Because I'm a college professor and I interact with students every day who have a really hard time navigating their lives and paying for school. So allow me to ask you this question. College tuition is rising faster than inflation and students are graduating with crushing student loans. What will you do in Congress to make college education more affordable? Well, we took some action this year when it came to the interest rates um, that happened with college loans. I didn't think that the solution that should be approached when it came to financing student loans that, that happened in the health care bill that Matt supports, uh, the complete government takeover of that, I didn't think was the right answer to go. I didn't think that uh, removing the competition from that market was helpful in making sure that students had access to credit and made sure that it was going to be affordable in the future. 
But keeping those interest rates low, we're good for our students. And so it's one of those things that I made a priority as we went through this last Congress. Uh, but then also making sure when you look at our college students today, when they're graduating, they're going to be required to pay off those loans. And when the ones that are graduating today, 50% of them are unemployed or they're underemployed, which means that they're not working in an area that they were trained for, where they got their degree. They have to work at a different job that may pay them less, which doesn't give them the benefits or the income that they need to pay off those loans once they complete that schooling. I'll, I'll tell you what, we've got the highest corporate income tax rate in the world. And when businesses look at where they're going to put businesses, and they look at the regulations that we have in this country, the increase in regulations and taxes, the fact that we are the highest taxing country when it comes to corporate taxes, uh, they don't put their businesses here. They don't make that decision. So what we need to do is we need to have fundamental tax reform. We need to lower that rate. We need to make sure that we're competitive so the businesses want to come into the United States and establish themselves and give our college students an opportunity to work in a position that they actually were trained for, to get a job, to make sure that they have the opportunity to pay off those student loans and to make sure that they can provide for their families. And right now with the tax code that we have, uh, it isn't allowing the opportunity to do that. We've had businesses leave. We've had jobs go away. And when we voted for our House budget this year, we voted for fundamental tax reform. We lowered the six different income levels to two. We made them much more competitive, but we closed the loopholes and the exemptions. We think that it should be a fairer and a flatter system, that we need to have people making sure that they know that the government's years of picking winners and losers, which is the only time that I use that phrase, is in our tax code. And that somebody who's taken the time to come to D.C. and lobby for a special provision, that that's not going to happen when it comes to our taxes anymore, that we're going to make sure we give businesses the opportunity to come here and be successful and to employ those college students that right now are being underserved with the opportunities that they have in front of them. I think if this room were filled with college students and you asked the question, uh, how will we help all of you to afford college, and you gave the answer, we're going to get more corporate tax breaks, I would go over like a ton of bricks, especially when you also tell them we're going to cut your Pell Grants so you have less help to pay for those bills that come due. This is just a fundamental disagreement we have about how to grow a middle class in this country. I personally am someone who, as I said at the beginning, started out in a lower income situation. And I qualified for reduced price school lunches when I was a kid in school. I qualified for Pell Grants and Stafford loans. And it was only because of those things, along with my own work ethic, that I was able to climb the ladder and work my way into the middle class so that I don't qualify for those things anymore. And that's how it's supposed to work. But when you have members of Congress that say, we've got to defend those tax breaks for Donald Trump and others at all costs, and pay for them by cutting Pell Grants, cutting Head Start, cutting other education funding, cutting Medicare, cutting Medicaid. I think you're standing with the wrong people. We need a member of Congress who stands with us. And we talk about uh, these special interest provisions of picking winners and losers, but that's uh, what some call production tax credit for wind. You talk about creating jobs and how can we give those college students opportunities. We absolutely have to do that. And we can do that by extending the production tax credit so the kids at Mitchell Technical Institute have wind jobs to go to when they've been trained to be a wind maintenance technician. We can do that by promoting biofuels and passing a farm bill. But right now you've got folks who are ranchers or maybe they're involved in dairy where the safety net has totally expired. That kind of uncertainty is what harms our economy. And that's a big reason why we haven't grown faster because this Congress is stopping progress on a whole host of issues. And I think we agree that uncertainty is bad. And the fact that the House hasn't passed that farm bill, hasn't passed the production tax credit, is what's weighing down the economy. And if we elect members of Congress who are willing to work together, focused on progress, willing to find common ground, we can actually get this economy moving once again. Yeah, you know, the Senate hasn't passed a PTC tax credit. And, and that you talked about that earlier in one of your responses, that the reason the PTC hasn't been extended is because of Tea Party members. And the last time I checked, there's not very many Tea Party members in the Senate. So the Senate hasn't passed that yet either. I actually carried a a letter to all of my freshmen telling them about the importance of the PTC and what it means for our energy independent future and took it to the leadership team. I also visited with Chairman Camp, who's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and asked him to include the PTC in his tax extenders uh, program at the end of the year to make sure that we could get that done. We've already seen job losses. Um, I sponsored a bill uh, back at the beginning of the year to put forward the PTC, recognizing that we could avoid it if we were proactive on it. 
Unfortunately, things in D.C. are a wreck, and that people don't recognize the value of having that. But that's why I signed on to a bill to extend it for the next four years to make sure that wind energy has an opportunity to get its feet under us so that it can continue to provide us with renewable, clean energy on into the future. That's a perfect place to stop because my timekeeper now tells me that you're both even for time. There we go. Now we're going to move on to our next phase yes, of the well debate. Done. So uh, go ahead and take a moment to collect yourselves. This is where you'll be asking each other a question. You'll have one minute to pose the question. The respondent will have two minutes to respond. So Mr. Virilich, you will have an opportunity to ask the question first. You will have one moment uh, to frame, form, and express that question. And Congresswoman, you will have two minutes to respond to that, and then vice versa after that. Well, for me, hard work has been a theme in this campaign, and standing up for South Dakotans. And we've talked about your attendance record, and initially the fact that it was four out of 20 Ag Committee meetings that you went to. And then we looked at the Native American Subcommittee, and you had only gone to five out of 22. And out of the five that you went to, four of those came after the Ag Committee groups. So it appeared to be a case of trying to cover some tracks. And then the Early Childhood Subcommittee, you only went to one out of seven. So my question is, out of the many committees that you um, talk about as the reason you can't go, are there any where you've gone to more than half the meetings? You know, when you look at uh, the committees that I'm a part of, I'm on more committees than the average member of Congress. I think you would agree with that. I serve on three major committees and nine subcommittees, so a total of 12. Um, I serve on the Education and Workforce Committee, which we haven't had a member of South Dakota on for the last 30 years. And it's been a good opportunity for me to give a perspective on education from a rural state. I think I'm one of the few members on that committee that actually has kids that go to a public school. Um, and so that's going to been a good perspective to have. Um, you know, I will always wake up in the morning and decide to go where I could be the most effective for South Dakota. We've proven that some of the meetings you say I wasn't at, that I was at, um, that I have had over 800 different constituent meetings with South Dakotans, um, that I have worked very hard to make sure that my voting record is 99% in committee, it's 98 on the House floor. Uh, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to sit through a committee hearing that's on the Chesapeake Bay watershed when I could be meeting with the Rapid City Chamber. I'm not going to sit through a committee hearing on uh, looking at specific water issues that deal with states that are parochial in nature that have nothing to do with South Dakota when I could be meeting with members and leaders of an energy corporation from South Dakota. I'm going to be testifying. Uh, one of the instances that you referred to that I missed was an Ag Committee hearing that lasted eight minutes. And I was testifying in the Energy and Commerce meeting on the wind energy legislation that I introduced. So uh, the facts are is that I'm don't judge my uh, record on just showing up and giving speeches in front of a camera. I judge my record on results that I deliver for South Dakota. And that's what I've been doing. I've been making sure that I'm getting more resources and have gotten $2 million more million for the pine beetle battle that we've got going out here. That in the Farm Bill, I've included uh, legislation that will help us cut through the red tape that's keeping us from going on that U.S. Forest Service land. I've been fighting for our VA hospital in Hot Springs. I've been making sure that we make these things a priority because they're important for South Dakota. And I've shown up every single day of my life for South Dakota agriculture. It's in my heart and it runs through my blood. So I will do everything I can to make sure that we have a strong ag community here in South Dakota on into the future. Congresswoman, uh, if you'd like to take a moment, it is now your opportunity to ask a question of your opponent. Well, when I look at the fact that you've said that you're going to vote for President Obama again into the future, when I look at the things that he has done that have been so detrimental to South Dakota, uh, when it comes to the Obamacare bill and what that's going to do to South Dakota businesses, when it comes to excess regulations that are going to be bad for us, the bureaucracy that they have created that keeps us from addressing the pine beetle epidemic, when it comes to the VA trying to shut down uh, hospitals and clinics that our veterans depend on, that they need, I would just like you to give us three reasons why you're going to vote for President Obama and why you think he's good for South Dakota. I have said that as a private citizen, I'll be voting for the president, but I'm running for Congress for South Dakota's one U.S. House seat. When it comes to policy, I agree with him on some things, and I disagree with him on others. But I disagree with you on a great many more issues, and that's what this race is about. 
you and I have a very fundamental difference of opinion about how we can strengthen the middle class in this country. You think we should do it through cuts alone, protecting tax breaks. I think we should do it through a balanced approach that really makes progress on the deficit, but preserves Medicare for the future, that preserves Pell Grants, that has enough resources available for the Pine Beetle, and so the VA doesn't have to take actions like closing the VA, uh, partly potentially for a lack of funding. And so if we take that balanced approach, we can keep on making investments where we need them, but also tackling the deficit so that we get the economic benefits of starting to bend the curve downward. If we follow your approach and giving huge new tax breaks, we're either going to blow the deficit even bigger, or we're going to have to make those radical cuts in things that are going to impact all the people in this room. So we have a difference of opinion about that. Uh, I have a difference of opinion with the president on some things too, but the bottom line is I will answer to the people of South Dakota first and foremost because we only have one voice. And if our voice isn't heard, uh, that's, that's a shame. I'm going to try to uh, make sure South Dakota is better represented. Thank you. We're now going to be moving on to final comments. Uh, since you won the coin toss before the debate, you will be the first speaker again. You will have five minutes to work with. So I speak first again? I thought I was closing. Uh, we want to give you, uh, you're getting the primacy effect in speaking first, mm -hmm. and that way we give the recency effect to your opponent, then there's no advantage psychologically. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. I won't take very long, but I really appreciate you being invested in this debate and uh, coming here to listen and hear the differences. I think you know about me and my background. Um, I ran for Congress because I really felt like we needed common sense in Washington, D.C. We've got a president that, that spends too much money. He taxes too much, and now he wants more. And he can't prioritize. He hasn't done a budget. Remember that Republicans in Washington, D.C., which Matt likes to call so dysfunctional, we're only one half of one third of the government out there. We're not running the city. Uh, and it is this president and his administration which has gotten everything that he's wanted. And we've got more people in poverty than we've ever had before. We've got more people on government assistance than we've ever had before. We've got people on unemployment that have been there for months and even years. And we've got to have changes. And when you have someone running for Congress who says he's going to vote for President Obama, yet can't name one single thing that President Obama does that's good for South Dakota, that's discouraging for me. That tells me that they don't understand what we need here. He says he's going to protect Obamacare, the health care bill that takes the decision making of your health care choices out of your hands and gives it to the federal government. He says that he wants to tax you more. He wants to spend more money. Uh, that is very concerning for me. Um, it is time that the federal government learns to live within its means and to prioritize its dollars and not come back and, and pick our pockets every single time that they waste $500 million on Solyndra. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, with the money that was spent on Solyndra, we could have funded that Sanford lab for decades. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that we've got in this country, is that this administration is picking losers to invest in with your hard-working money. We had to fight back cuts to Ellsworth that this administration wanted to make and make sure that our B-1 bomber program was going to be strong in the future. We had to show up every day to make sure that they don't gut our national security so that we can sleep safe in our beds every single night. So you have a very clear choice in this election. And I hope that when you think about it and you talk to your friends and your neighbors, that you will tell everybody out there really what is at stake. Because America is at a crossroads, and we need to have leaders in Washington, D.C. who have the fortitude to make the tough decisions to put solutions on the table and ask people what they think, and then vote to make changes from the current policies that we have. So I appreciate all of you. May God richly bless you, and go hug a veteran or a service member today, because because of them, we all can do what we're doing here today. Amen. Thank you. Well, I'll start by thanking you, Congresswoman, uh, because we've disagreed today and disagreed vigorously sometimes, but it is great to have this kind of exchange so that the people of South Dakota get the information they need to make a good decision. And I thank everyone once again for participating in this event. Uh, I am proud of my heritage as a person who grew up in southeastern South Dakota and who has had to work hard my whole life. I'm proud of my record working with Senator Johnson, working on Ellsworth, for example. When Ellsworth was on the chopping block, uh, I played a small part in uh, this community's effort and this state's effort to save it. And I'm so proud of the effort that was made and was successful. Uh, and I think the experience that I have uh, in that role in working well with others from across the congressional delegation, 
working with the governor's office, and working with local leaders, no matter what their political orientation, uh, that's an example of the kind of pragmatic, focused approach that I will take to Washington, D.C. Uh, we have a fundamental difference about philosophy here. I believe we should have a member of Congress who stands on the side of the middle class and takes a balanced approach to deficit reduction so that we don't have to put all the burden on middle class families. My opponent says that she will protect those tax breaks for those at the top uh, because of that pledge that she's taken. So that's a clear choice for people to decide. I oppose this plan to privatize Medicare. Uh, my opponent has voted for it. That's a difference that people will just have to decide when they go into the voting booth. We also have a difference when it comes to style. Uh, this my way or the highway style that has caused the farm bill to stall, that has caused the multiple threats to shut down the government since the last election, that's getting us nowhere. That uncertainty that it's imposing on the economy is what's making it harder for young people to find economic opportunity. I bring a different approach, that pragmatic approach that I talked about, where I'm willing to work with others uh, and find common ground and focus on results. Finally, I have a work ethic that I would be proud to take to Washington, D.C. on behalf of the people of South Dakota. We've talked about the attendance issue. We've talked about the multiple committees where there are questions about whether my opponent has been showing up and speaking on behalf of South Dakota. It started with the Ag Committee. That's where this began. When we heard the excuse that it's normal for a member of Congress to miss all those meetings because they have so many other commitments, I said, well, why don't we look at other members of Congress? Because they also had multiple committee assignments. They also had competing constituent uh, requests and opportunities for meetings. So we went back and looked at transcripts from previous members of Congress from South Dakota. And you may have seen this comparison done before. We printed out the transcript from when John Thune was in his first year on the House Ag Committee. So for an apples to apples comparison. And his transcript filled 40 pages. Because he went to those meetings, he spoke up for South Dakota, he asked questions, he was an aggressive advocate for South Dakota. He filled a thick stack of papers. Print out the transcript for Bill Janklow, well, that fills a really thick stack of papers. <laughs> because Bill Janklow was aggressive, he talked quickly. In fact, Senator Daschle made the remark at Governor Janklow's eulogy that my friend Bill talked fast, he talked at speeds of 80 words a minute, and gusts up to 120. <laughs> His transcript filled 52 pages. And then you print out the transcript from my opponent in her first year in the Ag Committee, and I brought it with me again, and it's right here, and it fits on this one sheet of paper. So whatever the excuses are, the bottom line is, South Dakotans are not getting the kind of hardworking, focused, and dedicated representation that we've had in the past on a bipartisan basis. That has to change. I'm running to change it. I believe South Dakotans deserve a member of Congress who works just as hard as they do. And if you choose me in this election, that's exactly what you'll get. So I thank you, and I'm honored to be here participating and asking for your vote in this election. Thank you.